Good morning, everyone. This is Olivia Marquez, and I am a team member with Health Evidence. It is my pleasure today to welcome you to our very special monthly webinar series. And today we will be discussing community engagement in public health interventions for disadvantaged groups. What's the evidence? So today we will be going through a few polling questions throughout the session. Uh, this is just a slide to note your consent. We will not be sharing uh, any of the information uh, that you provide through the polling questions and your participation is anonymous. After today, the PowerPoint presentation and the audio recording will be made available uh, through Health Evidence SlideShare account and the Health Evidence YouTube account. So the links to those resources will be posted in the chat section on WebEx. So that's on the right-hand panel within WebEx. And today we will be discussing um, the review, the effectiveness of community engagement in public health interventions for disadvantaged groups, a meta-analysis. And again, the, the link to this review within Health Evidence will be posted in the chat section. So just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Please use the Q&A and chat function in WebEx to post your questions or comments. We ask that you please send your questions or comments to uh, all participants and not just to the host. But if you do, it's not a problem. We will still see uh, your posts and comments come through. Towards the end of the session, we will have a uh, opened question and answer session, and I'll be able to read your questions aloud to our presenters to respond. You don't need to wait until the end of the session to post your questions. You can do so as we go through. And for your best connection today, we recommend you use a wired versus wireless internet connection. And for the audio, please listen through your speakers and make sure to go to the Communicate tab at the top in WebEx and click Audio Connection. Should you have any issues today, WebEx has a 24-7 helpline that you can call to help get you connected. Again, this information will be posted in the chat section as well. We have our first polling question today uh, before we get started, and we're wondering how many people are watching today's session with you? Are you by yourself? Do you have one or three other individuals with you? Four to five, six to ten, or a larger more than ten group? So thank you to those who are responding. Please make sure to select your response and then click Submit at the bottom. So we see quite a few people are by themselves, and we have a few other people who are joining uh, in larger groups today. So that's great. Thank you to those who are responding. Okay, and just a special thanks before we get started to the large team at Health Evidence who helps to coordinate our monthly webinar series. Uh, as many of you know, we have been uh, away from our monthly webinar series over the summer, so we're very excited to uh, reintroduce our session for the fall. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar, Health Evidence launched in 2005, and we are a comprehensive registry of reviews evaluating the effectiveness of public health and health promotion interventions. We provide over 90,000 visitors per year access to over 4,700 quality-rated systematic reviews. We provide links to full text, plain language summaries, and podcasts where available. One of our main goals of health evidence, in addition to making evidence on the effectiveness of public health interventions more accessible, is to make it easier for professionals to use evidence in decision making. So the value added for using health evidence is that we help save you time. We've done the work to screen and appraise each review within our repository. We screen all reviews for relevance to public health and keep our registry up to date by constantly screening relevant databases and listservs. So at any given time, we're no more than about one to two months behind the publication date. We have done the work for you by critically appraising all reviews through a transparent process, whereby you can actually click on the full quality assessment for each review within our registry and see the rating uh, for each of our 10 assessment criteria. 
thehealthevidence.org has various tools and supports for uh, evidence-informed decision-making, which is available on our website, uh, which again, the links to that will be posted in the chat section. And through the years, many of our users have informed us that our tools and repository are easy and simple to use. So here we see on the slide a model for evidence-informed decision-making in public health, which consists of five components that you can see in the diagram. So traditionally, public health practitioners and decision-makers consider evidence about community health issues and local context, existing resources, and community and political climate when making decisions about programs and policies. However, it's become more apparent that considering evidence uh, about research may be more challenging. As such, the Health Evidence webinar series is designed to identify research evidence relevant to public health decisions and help facilitate you through that process. So here on the slide, we have uh, the stages of the process of evidence-informed public health that you can see on the wheel. And the wheel is a guide for practitioners and decision makers to determine how to address a particular issue by systematically incorporating research evidence in the decision making process. So there are seven steps in this process, uh, starting with clearly defining the problem. We will hear today about how our presenters have worked through the first four steps in this process in order to help with decision makers with the remainder of the seven steps. So we have our second polling question, which we will open in just a moment. And we're wondering if you have heard of PICO F before, if you're familiar with this. Again, if you can make sure to select your response and then hit submit at the bottom of the screen. So thank you to those who are responding. Uh, we have so far about a half and half split between yes and no. So Please continue to uh, respond to that question and we'll move on to our next slide where we'll go over what PICO-S actually stands for. So PICO-S is a way for you to structure your questions in a defined set in evidence-informed decision-making. And it involves defining who the population is that you're interested in, what the intervention is that you want to know about, the comparison group, if any, and sometimes this can be a little bit difficult to consider within the realm of public health, and any specific outcomes that you're looking for. So sometimes we also have a particular setting in mind, which could be, for example, school, or today we're considering community settings. The value of a PICO question is that when you have an issue that arises, you can use PICO to turn this into a searchable question, which allows you to further articulate specific components of the question that help you to hone in on that question. Searching for relevant information then uh, to your PICO question should be quicker and easier. And we'll move into our uh, third polling question today just before we get started. We're wondering uh, how often do you use systematic reviews to inform a program or service? So always, often, sometimes, never, or you may not be familiar with what a systematic review is. So we'll just open up that polling question uh, in a moment and we'll get an idea of uh, what you are familiar with. So thank you to those who have started to respond. We have uh, a few who always use systematic reviews, which is really great to hear, um, often and sometimes and a few who may never use systematic reviews or are not sure what a systematic review is, which is uh, completely fine. We hope that today's session will enlighten you on what a systematic review actually is. So continue to answer those questions, and in the meantime, uh, we'll bring us back to our presentation. And today, it is my pleasure to be inviting Allison Omara Eves and Ginny Brunton today from London who are presenting on their systematic review. So thank you, Allison and Ginny, for joining us today. I will pass the ball along to you and let you take it away. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Claire. Uh, this is Ginny Brunton here um, and my colleague, Allison. Hello. Um, we're going to uh, talk to you about our research today. Um, we appreciate the opportunity, actually, to, to talk about this. This is a large systematic review that we undertook um, a few years back, uh, looking at whether uh, public health interventions that engage the community in some way improved health-related outcomes, particularly for disadvantaged groups. And uh, that was about a two-year program of work. Allison and I work uh, at that building, uh, near that building there, that's the Institute of Education, and it's part of University College London. We work in a, a research unit called the Evidence for Policy and Practice Information and Coordinating Center, which happily we shortened to EpiCenter. Um, and as I say, that's part of the Department of Social Science at UCL London. So just to tell you a little bit about this um, project, it was funded by the UK National Institute for Health Research, or NIHR, and uh, this was a large multi-group project that we undertook with colleagues at the London School of Economics, uh, University of East London, and ourselves, a uh, team of us at UCL Epicentre. And the final report that resulted was a whopping 548 pages. I think that's still the record for the largest report we've ever published. Um, and it's uh, this large because there are multiple syntheses in it. Uh, so we're going to try to break it down into a, a much more digestible nugget for you all today. Um, today we're going to talk basically about our, our definitions of community engagement and health inequalities that we used, a little bit of the background about the research project, the why and how, and then two of the syntheses that we undertook from that systematic review, so a theory synthesis that looked at conceptual understandings of community engagement, and a meta-analysis that looked at the effectiveness of community engagement initiatives, and then just some conclusions to draw it all together. So the research topic, well, it's probably helpful to have a look at what we mean by community engagement. Um, we define that as a, a direct or indirect process of involving communities uh, in decision making and or in the planning, design, governance, and delivery of services. And that might be done uh, using any combination of methods of consultation, collaboration, uh, or community control. And that's quite a broad definition. Uh, community engagement can therefore take many forms, and some examples of those are some of these ones that we've listed here. Community coalitions are quite often talked about. Uh, peer delivery of interventions is also a form of community engagement, pu public consultations, and so on. But we're also interested in community engagement in relation to health inequalities. And health inequalities here are uh, socially determined differences in health outcomes. So these the causes of these are generally modifiable. So for example, you could change somebody's socioeconomic status or you could improve social exclusion or reduce social exclusion. Um, those are modifiable things that you can, you can target uh, rather than sort of biological causes such as a genetic predisposition for a disease. Uh, and um, Sir Michael Marmot uh, has done a lot of work uh, in England uh, looking at uh, inequalities in health and he uh, produced a report in 2010 for the Secretary of State for Health, which is like the Minister of Health in, in England, uh, called uh, Fair Society and Healthy Lives. And this was a review to propose the most effective evidence-based strategies to reduce health inequalities in England going forward. And, and that report, his team identified four key modifiable health risks, uh, smoking, alcohol abuse, substance abuse, and obesity so very firmly placed in, in the public health realm. Um, he, the team also suggested that reducing health inequalities requires action in six very broad priority areas, and they're listed here for you to have a look at. You know, it has to do with things like giving children the best start in life, allowing people to maximize their capabilities, provide fair employment, a healthy standard of living, healthy and sustainable places, and strengthening the role and impact of health prevention. Now, I mention these here now because we utilize these later in, in structuring our analyses. 
So when you're thinking about community engagement and health inequalities together, community engagement is, we argued, particularly suited for disadvantaged and socially excluded groups, um, particularly because community engagement is thought to encourage social justice and it can give a voice to the voiceless. So people who might not otherwise be able to make their needs known or um, get change in the way that is of the most benefit to them. Uh, community engagement can also produce interventions that might better meet communities' needs by, you know, being more culturally competent or more empathic to what a particular community needs. So, in terms of the broader project, When you think about community engagement, there's quite a patchwork of theories about why community engagement should be used and how community engagement actually works. What does it look like? Um, there's a lot of discussion uh, about uh, community engagement from a lot of different philosophical traditions. And there's a very unclear empirical evidence about the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of community engagement strategies. So there's lots of discussion about what a great thing it is, but uh, we weren't sure about the empirical evidence about whether it was actually effective or not. Uh, and you know, coupled with that, there's a lot of uncertainty about the processes, as I said, about how it works. Um, is there sort of a formula to undertaking it? So we thought, being good research methodologists, we should undertake a systematic review. And the process that we undertook to do that was a standard systematic review. So we undertook sensitive searches. Uh, we, uh, and I'll just go through this quickly and then talk about how we modified it a little. We undertook sensitive searches and we looked for systematic reviews, um, but we also looked for trials, specifically around community engagement. We identified primary studies within reviews or trials of community engagement. We extracted data from these studies on key concepts and characteristics. And we used that to create sort of a broad map of intervention so that we could try to understand where community engagement had been used, with what populations, what interventions, what kind of outcomes, and so on. And then we selected particular interventions that targeted uh, marmot, uh, the priority areas. Remember those six priority areas I was talking about earlier um, for our in-depth review, for our meta-analysis. And from those, we extracted effectiveness data or outcomes data, and we assessed the risk of bias. And then we conducted syntheses. So when I say syntheses, I do mean syntheses. There were four different syntheses undertaken. So we did a meta-analysis of effectiveness. We did a thematic synthesis of processes from integral process evaluations. We did an economic analysis of cost and resource data. And we did a theoretical synthesis of uh, conceptual underpinnings. Now, what I'm going to talk about, or Allison and I are going to talk about today, are just the results of the theory synthesis and the meta-analysis. Um, we thought it was probably important to talk about the conceptual underpinnings of community engagement and how that structured uh, the meta-analysis that we ran subsequently. So the first bit is the theory synthesis. And just a brief bit about the methods with that. Uh, as I said earlier, there's a lot of theories about why community engagement is important and how it might work. And there were lots of discussion papers about why it perhaps didn't work. Um, we ended up extracting data from, that should say, retrieved studies. So it wasn't just included trials. It was also data from key discussion pieces. Um, what's sometimes referred to as background articles, and from exemplar process evaluations, so that we had a broad range of types of community engagement and uh, a wide philosophical base of discussion about community engagement. We then grouped the data that we extracted, and we iteratively developed themes. And I tried to illustrate what that looked like. So in this little diagram at the bottom, I'm going to see if I can use my pointer here. Um, I'm not sure I can use my pointer. So I don't want to. I think I'll just, I'll just talk you through it. So on the left-hand side at the top, there's discussion pieces or process data. 
Um, and we took data, uh, data from those and we constructed a conceptual framework that uh, represented all the characteristics that people talked about uh, of community engagement that they thought were associated with, you know, that intervention working or not working. We constructed a conceptual framework and we uh, ran it past our advisory group. So we had ongoing consultations with uh, an advisory group to help us develop this conceptual framework. When we thought that we had an a initial conceptual framework developed, we then looked at data from the trials and where there was data from the trials to inform the conceptual framework, we added that, uh, but we used the conceptual framework to actually look for patterns uh, in the trials that might suggest some theories of change or some mechanisms about how community engagement was working. And in the next slide, oh, thanks, Allison. So in the next slide, um, we ended up having a resulting conceptual framework, and I'm just going to talk you through this. This is a very simplistic version of the conceptual framework. Um, so there, there's the, the set of studies, the overall set of studies that we retrieved for this uh, review, we ended up having kind of two types of studies. So they're represented by the two triangles that you see on this, on this diagram. And the first one is uh, a set of studies that focused on community engagement as an intervention in its own right. And that might be things like um, improving park spaces in urban areas, um, that sort of thing that might have health outcomes attached to it. And then there was another set of studies that were looking purely at health interventions um, that might have some aspect of community engagement within them. So an example of that might be um, a breastfeeding, a community breastfeeding intervention that involved uh, uh, mothers as peer deliverers who might teach other mothers uh, techniques of breastfeeding. And so you have overlap between those two sets of studies. You might have some health interventions that have lots and lots of community engagement, and you might have some community engagement studies that have uh, more health intervention in them than others. Um, so within that, we started looking at you know, what people said about what worked and what didn't work with community engagement in those sets of studies. And they ended up being um, thematically grouped into these six areas. And so that, those were things like, uh, starting on the left-hand side, uh, needs. And that's who defines uh, the community. Does, is the community defined um, by, uh, say, a government body? Uh, saying that, you know, for example, pre, uh, uh, stillbirth in a particular community is too high. Or is it uh, the community defines themselves as, uh, uh, for example, a deaf community uh, that they're, uh, they self-identify? It might also be um, whether you're looking at populations who have specific needs or are socioeconomically disadvantaged, or communities, as I say, who self-identify, or they may be geographic communities, so within a particular neighborhood. Um, the next. Uh, theme over is the motivation. So that's a bit about why do people engage? Why do they do they do community engagement, or or maybe why they get asked? That maybe there's characteristics around that that influence whether it's successful or not. So people might engage because they want to be responsible citizens, or they might see that there's some community benefit to doing it. Um, government. Uh, bodies may invite people because they think it'll lead to better services and health, or leveraging resources. There might also be theoretical underpinnings uh, motivating community engagement. So it might be uh, that interventions are based on social learning theories or behavioral theories. The next column over is community participation. And this is really getting at the level and extent of community engagement. So uh, is community are is the community involved in design, delivery, and evaluation? All of them, one of them, two of them? Or is the community leading, collaborating, consulting, being consulted, or being informed? And obviously those are uh, you know, different levels of engagement. The next column over is the conditions under which 
community engagement takes place. Uh, there were some uh, studies that talked about uh, the mediators of community engagement. So, for example, if community members are very competent at being able to communicate and work in a coalition kind of setting or not, that may influence whether an intervention is successful. Um, but it may also be something to do with the context in which the community engagement takes place. So is the intervention set up in such a way that it's going to be sustainable over time, or will it stop when the funding runs out? Uh, and also, what's happening in government policy, and uh, are there sort of targets that need to be met? And do those targets change, and then that changes the intervention? So those kinds of things influence the type of community engagement that goes on. Uh, next are the actions that are undertaken. So that's actually the process stuff about whether there's collective decision making in the community engagement that goes on. Um, is there training support for people? Is there admin support for you know the community engagement meetings to take place, for example? Um, how often do they meet? For how long do they meet? Those kinds of um, process things. Uh, some some studies talked about the importance of those. And also things like implementation, the acceptability and cost and feasibility. And finally, um, another theme around community engagement was around the impact. So that's all about the beneficiaries, whether it's the people who actually are the community engagees, or is it the wider community that they're providing the intervention to. And that can be community service providers, government researchers, um, what kind of outcomes uh, what, uh, are impacted upon. So are there outcomes like health outcomes, or are there other things like attitudes, uh, mutual learning, social capital, self-esteem, and empowerment? And finally, are there any potential harms from community engagement? Some, some studies did talk about possible impacts because of social exclusion or cost overrun or attrition. Um, so there's lots of different characteristics that have been discussed that might influence whether community engagement is successful or not. And we basically took that information and looked at the trials to identify any patterns or any mechanisms that seem to be operating uh, as series of change. And what we came up with were four series of change that seem to be operating. Um, the first one was empowerment, where um, people thought that change was facilitated where a health need is identified by the community and they mobilize themselves into action. Um, there's uh, a second and third theory of change. Um, I'll talk a little bit later, or Allison will talk a little bit later about why those are sort of grouped together. Um, but these are community engagement uh, interventions that are based on a thinking that the views of stakeholders are sought in the belief that the intervention will be more appropriate to the participants' needs as a result. And then finally, there's a theory of change around lay delivery, where community engagement might be implemented because um, there's a thought that change will happen because of the credibility or expertise or, or empathy uh, that the community member brings to the delivery of the intervention. So we had a look to see if there were differences in uh, trials uh, in the, the effect sizes based on those um, conceptual underpinnings of the community engagement intervention. So what I'm going to do now is hand it over to Alison and she'll talk to you a bit about the meta-analysis. So, hello, this is Alison here. Um, we've already established, I think, and hopefully it's come across, that this was a massive piece of work. Um, we really put a lot of effort into this and generated a magnificent and beautiful report <laughs> that is not the most accessible because it is so huge. So we've been trying to distill some of the most important messages out uh, for different potential users. So we've pr produced some publications around some of the method stuff that we did, um, but also for policy makers and practitioners and decision makers. Um, so we're trying to make it a little bit more accessible. So this, we're really, um, we appreciate health evidence and we're, we're grateful for this opportunity to try and get across some of the messages from the meta-analysis because it was big and it's hard to, to get that message across um, in writing. We have produced a journal article which is a mere 23 pages um, that covers the key points, the meta-analysis, 
So if you are interested in a bit more about how we did the statistics and also some of the, the actual results, we're giving headline findings here, but if you want to get into a bit more of the actual results, um, we, it, it, it's worth having a look at this uh, journal article because it, it breaks it down a little bit. I got slightly distracted and you may have heard me stutter a moment there because I just saw someone's posted notes say thanks for the second shorter article. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure to write and I hope it's useful. Um, but now we're going to run through some of what we think were the key findings from this shorter paper um, and hopefully uh, you'll find it interesting and a bit useful. It's a bit of a whistle stop tour though. So I'm just going to go through some of the descriptive statistics and, and um, about the actual studies that we included in the review. Now the whole review, we actually had 320 studies that we looked at, but time and budget constraints meant that we needed to slim it down a little bit. And also it was, it was conceptually, it was very diverse. So what we did was we looked back at what that Marmot review that, um, that Ginny was mentioning earlier about Fair Society, Fair Lives. Uh, we looked at what some of the key policy messages were in that, that that they needed evidence on to help address health inequalities in England. And I suspect these the same issues are, are similar across the world. So hopefully they're still relevant to, to you outside of uh, the UK. Um, but we ended up narrowing it down to studies that addressed some of those four modifiable health risks that Ginny mentioned, as well as the six policy priority areas. And we ended up with a set of 131 studies um, that met our inclusion criteria. And when we talk about inclusion criteria, we're talking about those PICO elements, P-I-C-O, uh, that Olivia mentioned at the start of the oh, presentation. Claire. Claire. Oh, Claire, was that Claire? Yeah. Sorry. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <For all I can. laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so just to give you a bit of a sense of what the database, of the, you know, the set of primary studies that we analysed um, in the following sections, what they looked like, um, it was a range of countries, but the vast majority for, were from North America. Uh, studies, 90% of the studies were conducted in, in North America. Um, obviously, we had a, a population interest in, in the health inequalities issue, and we we coded information or tried to um, represent different types of, of potential health inequalities in the literature. But the most common um, health inequality that was mentioned in the studies uh, was that of ethnic minority groups, uh, followed by low socioeconomic position um, populations. There were also a sizable number of studies that uh, addressed multiple health inequalities. We covered a vast um, variety of health topics. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see the most commonly represented um, interventions were in the areas of substance abuse, cardiovascular disease, um, and breastfeeding, um, but there was a whole range of different health topics that were covered uh, in the literature. Basically, community engagement is used in a lot of different aspects of public health and health promotion. We also looked at a number of different types of outcomes. Um, our primary focus was on health behaviours because of our mission to, to try and understand um, these modifiable health behaviours. So health behaviours included things like the, the extent and duration of breastfeeding or whether people attended cancer screening or, or attempts to quit smoking, things like that. We were also interested in any health consequences that were measured. So by health consequences, we mean things that are likely to result from a change in a health behaviour. So things like mortality or diagnosis of an illness or a particular condition. And we saw 38 studies measured some kind of health consequence. We were also interested in psychosocial outcomes, um, particularly participant self-efficacy. Now, self-efficacy is a person's belief that they can change their own behaviours. So do they have the ability to quit smoking? Do they feel capable of quitting smoking, as an example? Uh, 20 studies looked at participant self-efficacy. And we also looked at social support. So whether the participants in the interventions felt that they were um, better supported, whether by their peers, their family, 
even strangers, um, but did they think they received um, greater social support as a result of being involved in the intervention? And seven studies measured some kind of social support. We were, of course, very interested in um, community outcomes and what we called engagee outcomes. So these are outcomes for the people that were um, engaged in the intervention, either through the design or the delivery of the intervention. So these are the people that are, are lay, lay people that are involved in the intervention in some way. Um, unfortunately, very, very few studies uh, measured any community or engagee outcomes. And where they did, they were completely different. They were defined in such different ways that we, we just couldn't combine them statistically. Um, we do describe them narratively in the report. Um, but not statistically. So for the eagle-eyed observer, you may have noticed that we actually have more than 131 outcomes, um, 131 being the number of studies that we analysed. This is because many of the studies reported more than one type of outcome. So they often had health behaviours and self-efficacy, for example. So we conducted our analyses separately for these different health outcomes. And you'll see on this table um, the second column, which is labelled pooled effect size estimate. What that number represents is the, the difference between the intervention group, so the participants that actually received the intervention, um, and the outcome, uh, the, the difference between the intervention group and the control group or comparison group. So what we're measuring here is how much of an improvement are we seeing in health behaviour or health consequence, whatever the outcome happens to be, what is the improvement in the intervention group relative to the control group? When we see a positive number, so a number that's greater than zero, that means that we are seeing some improvement for the intervention group relative to the control or comparison group. When we see those little asterisks or little stars next to that number in the second column, that tells us that the result is statistically significant. And you'll see that for all four outcomes that we looked at, health behaviours, health consequences, self-efficacy and social support, all of those were statistically significant, which means for all of our outcomes, the intervention group performed better than the control group um, at the completion of the intervention. So that's a nice finding and we were excited by that and we were pleased by that. And that's why we had the little dude with the, um, the what are balloons? I was about to call them umbrellas. Ah, the balloons, because we're very excited about this finding. In general, these community engagement interventions are effective. However, you'll also notice towards the right-hand side of this table, uh, the section called heterogeneity. And what this section is telling us, we run statistical tests to determine whether the um, results are likely to have occurred by more than just chance, and also whether there's variation amongst the studies that needs to be explained. We found there was significant statistical heterogeneity. So the studies differ from each other in some sub substantial way, um, which we don't see this as a limitation. We see this as an opportunity to try and understand why these work differently for different people in different contexts. We wanted to attempt to explain that variation between the studies by conducting moderator and regression analyses. If you're familiar with statistical analysis in primary research, the moderator analyses are basically uh, like your ANOVAs, except you're using summary statistics rather than individual patient or as individual participant data. Um, and the regression analyses are very much as you would um, conduct, again, in, in primary research. So hopefully these concepts are a little bit familiar to you. If they're not, if you're not particularly quantitatively inclined, uh, you'll just have to trust us that this is how we explore variation <laughs> uh, in, the, in the studies. Um, the analyses that we conducted uh, were generally on the health behaviour outcomes because most of the other um, outcomes, so the consequences, self-efficacy and social support, we had a smaller number of studies and once you start breaking it down into subgroups, uh, you end up with too few studies in, in each type of, um, in each category of the subgroup. Um, so the bulk of the results that I'm presenting going forward relate to health behaviours only. 
So, as uh, you may have guessed from Jeannie's uh, wonderful introduction, we were really interested in theories of change. We wanted to know what was the underpinning reason why people would expect engaging members of the community in these interventions should work. So we did an analysis to see whether there was any difference between the studies depending on what theory of change underpins the intervention. You can see uh, in this table we've got five rows. So the first four rows are uh, representing, I'm just trying to get some kind of little tool to indicate this. First four rows are representing the different theories of change. Um, so the first one is the community identified the health need, which is aligned to kind of empowerment models. Then we have our collaboration to design more appropriate intervention and cons consultation to, the, to design more appropriate intervention. Now these two um, types of theory change are very similar in terms of how, um, why they would expect uh, community engagement to work. The difference is the extent to which the community is involved. So in the first type, collaborating, the, the engaged people have a very active role in designing an intervention. But in the, um, the next one, on consultation, they're, they're basically told what, what's going to happen in the intervention and they can suggest changes, but they're not as actively involved in the design. And then finally, we have um, delay delivered uh, models of theories of change. Now, you can see from the second column here that um, they're all positive and they're all statistically significant. So again, we have this happy finding that regardless of the theory of change used, we are seeing benefits of the intervention relative to the control group or the comparison group, which is statistically significant. For those that are uh, quite keen-eyed again, um, you'll notice that there is a final row, which is other theories of change. There were seven naughty renegade studies that didn't cooperate and didn't fit in with uh, any of our four definitions of the theories of change. Um, so we, we group those together as uh, un, <laughs> un pigeonholeable, uh, and you'll see there was no significant difference um, from the intervention group to the control group for those studies, and that's probably due to the, the heterogeneity. So the, the studies are basically too different from each other to, to really observe any clear trends. Uh, so they're the main highlights from this um, this table, and that's one of the most exciting findings from the study is that regardless of which um, theory of change underpins it, we're seeing benefits. We did observe, obviously, that lay delivered tended to be the most effective, um, but we noticed that there was a bit of a difference between the typical sample size in the um, in the studies that use these different theories of change. So those that were lay delivered, although they're the most effective, they also tended to be the smallest studies. Um, and we also noticed through other um, analysis and observation of the studies that these tended to be quite intensive interventions with lots of one-on-one -on -one treatment. Um, so a typical example here is breastfeeding interventions where um, mothers that have previously breastfed go and out to women's homes and help them um, establish breastfeeding for the new child. So they're very intensive, very personal interventions. So in some ways it's not that surprising that they're quite effective because they're, uh, they tend to be quite focused um, kind of interventions. We looked at a whole bunch of other moderators that I would love to go into more detail, but we're running out of time and I'd like to have some time for questions for you. So I'm just going to skim through the highlights. The one is single component interventions tended to be more effective at improving health behaviours than multiple component interventions. Um, and a lot of people have talked in, in the literature why this might be the case. Uh, so if you're having multiple components, it can um, overwhelm participants. Um, they can get intervention fatigue, and there's also sometimes the issue of dilution of the key messages. Um, so that might be why that why we're observing that. We also uh, observed that universal interventions, so those that were delivered to the kind of the whole population, so city wide, for example, 
tended to have higher effect sizes than um, those that were targeted interventions, just that those that had a, kind of a health need or a deficit in a particular um, area, particular health outcome. Uh, we observed that interventions that were conducted in non-community settings, so these are things um, like in the home or uh, in educational settings or primary care settings, things like that. Um, so non-community settings tended to be more effective than those in community settings. Uh, in terms of the features of the interventions themselves, um, interventions that employed skill development or training strategies or which offered contingent incentives. Now, the contingency is very important. If you just reward people regardless of whether they uh, change their behaviours or not, that's not going to work. You need to only reward good behaviour, basically. <laughs> um, these tended to be more effective than those employing purely educational strategies. So if you're just giving people information uh, that on its own um, wasn't as effective. Interventions that involved peers, community members or education professionals tended to be more um, effective than those involving health professionals alone. And shorter interventions tended to be more effective than longer interventions. Um, but as I kind of alluded to earlier when I was discussing lay delivered interventions, this is probably confounded by levels of exposure or intensity of contact with the intervention deliverer. So the shorter interventions tended to be very personalised, intensive interventions, whereas longer ones were things like media interventions or um, introducing cycle paths and things like that. So they, they're much broader, so you may not expect to see um, such big, big gains. Um, in terms of the participants, Interventions tended to be most effective in adult populations and less effective in general populations. And by general populations, I mean delivered to the whole city or area, so they're not um, targeting specific age groups. And interventions tended to be most effective for health behaviour outcomes uh, for p participants that were classified as disadvantaged due to socioeconomic position compared to the other different types of health inequalities that we looked at. So the conclusions, yay, we were happy. Overall public health interventions using community engagement um, appear to be effective in terms of all of the outcomes that we looked at. Um, one thing that I didn't uh, talk about in the results here, but they are covered in both the report and the shorter journal article, um, is that we, we did test for methodological biases, so we looked at risk of bias in the studies, and the findings did not appear to, to be due to those to any kind of systematic methodological biases. So um, the findings appear to be robust uh, across different methodological um, types and quality assessments that we did. Um, however, as you can probably expect, there's a lot of unexplained vari variation amongst the effect sizes we had a very diverse data set, and we knew that going to this. We explicitly um, set out to capture a wide range of different community engagement interventions in different health settings. So we knew there was heterogeneity or variation between the studies before we even started the analysis. We didn't need the statistics to tell us that, basically. Um, but we don't see that as a weakness of this study. Um, we see that as a strength because it gives us a rich data set to start to explore some of this variation. And we know that there are probably um, lots of interaction effects. So, for example, the fact that lay delivered interventions tended to also coincide with those that were more intensive and more personalised. Um, and, and these sorts of things, we hope, provide future researchers, or potentially even ourselves, um, some guidance on ways that we can start exploring this literature a bit further and getting down to the, the nuts and bolts. Who really is this working for? Under what conditions? In what settings? Uh, what outcomes? And so on. Um, we concluded in the report, this is a quote from it, that the evidence suggests that community engagement in public health is more likely to require a fit-for-purpose rather than a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, so we were keen to not conclude and say only one type of community engagement seems to work because different types of community engagement seem to work better for different populations and in different contexts. Um, 
So we have to be creative and, and reflexive, I think, uh, when, when considering what type of community engagement to use in, in applied settings. And uh, we concluded that it's important to consult with communi communities to determine whether and how they want to be engaged in public health activities. We shouldn't just um, impose our, our structures on them, I suppose. So I'd like to um, finish off here and acknowledge uh, the co-authors of the report. Uh, we all put in a lot of hard work to this, and I hope it's been useful for you. Please do have a look at the final report if you are excited by this in any way, shape, or form. And um, you can contact myself or Jimmy, um, and we'd be happy to talk further about this. I'm sorry we only have 10 minutes of discussion now, but we can open up to discussion. Thank you very much, Alison and Ginny. That was a, a great review. Um, and I know that was a very uh, comprehensive and exhaustive review, so it was great to hear what you, you could share in our limited time today. And the way that you discussed the results was really great. I'm sure you're leaving participants with the skills to go back to the review, uh, should they be interested in looking at other uh, outcomes or components uh, that they can find in the review. So I'm just going to I'll pass the ball back to myself. Um, to go through the remainder of the presentation. We have a few more polling questions for our participants. And uh, in the meantime, so we'll open up polling question number four. So the information presented to you, if you can just provide um, us with a little bit of feedback would be great. And in the meantime, Allison and Ginny, I'm going to read out some of the questions that we've had posted so far. And I invite all participants to continue to post any questions in the chat or Q&A box. So starting first, uh, we have a question from Mark Andrew who's asking, if you can please clarify the difference between community engagement and community mobilization. Yeah, um, it's Ginny here. Um, I think we, we conceptualized, one of the things we found when we started looking was that community engagement uh, is a term that's uh, used interchangeably with lots of other terms like community development, community mobilization, empowerment strategies, and these are all um, based on different theories, uh, as I say, of different thinking about why you engage a community in the first place. So community mobilization, I guess, is one aspect of community engagement. Community engagement, we, we conceptualized as a broader term that encompassed a lot of these other terms. Does that help? That's great. Thanks, Ginny. And uh, we'll see if we get any feedback from Mark Andrew about that response, but that's great. I think that's helpful. Okay. We have another question from Lise who's asking if you will be publishing your conceptual framework for community engagement in interventions. Funny you should mention that. <laughs> um, I just submitted it uh, to Health Expectations actually last week and we're waiting to hear. So hopefully, uh, uh, again, a more digestible version of the conceptual framework will be available. Um, but you're, you're uh, definitely welcome to, to look at the full report to try and get your head around, and I'm happy to answer any questions about it. It was a labor of love. <laughs> I can absolutely imagine. That's really great to hear, and uh, definitely a lot of work that certainly a, a large audience will be appreciating. And uh, our next question comes from Carrie, who's asking if uh, maybe you mentioned this, or if you could clarify or define what lay delivered means. So these are interventions in which a member of the community that doesn't have any particular um, formal training in healthcare, uh, when they're actually involved in delivering the intervention. So the classic example of this is the one um, I gave an example in the presentation about um, peer counsellors for breastfeeding mothers. So uh, someone that's just been through the experience of breastfeeding themselves going out and helping another mother establish breastfeeding with her child. So it's, it's about non-expert in the sense of formal training. Obviously, they have their own expertise because they've lived the experience. Um, but yeah, the, the formal lack of formal training aspect is the key to that one, and that they're delivering the intervention, not just designing or planning the intervention. Yes. 
That's great. Thanks very much. That's very helpful. And uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to open up our, our last polling question, which is a uh, select all that apply, which you can review as you continue uh, to submit your questions. Uh, so next, uh, we have a question from Fatima, who's asking Allison, if you can explain targeted interventions. You said interventions for disadvantaged population was beneficial. What type of interventions were successful for these populations? So the first part of the question about targeted interventions, uh, these are ones where participants were chosen for inclusion in the, in the intervention on the basis of a, a health need. Um, so for example, mothers that were struggling to establish breastfeeding. I'll just keep using that example because I've already introduced it now, but obviously the whole report was not just about <laughs> breastfeeding. Um, so if, if a mother was identified as having trouble establishing breastfeeding, then she would have had an identified health need and would be targeted for receiving a specific intervention. In comparison to a universal intervention where a breastfeeding counsellor might have been assigned to every mother uh, in the hospital uh, uh, directly after labour, regardless of whether she was having trouble establishing breastfeeding or not. So it's kind of going to anyone, um, whether they're, they, they have some kind of need uh, in that respect or not. Does that example clarify or I can give that's more? Great. I think that's a great explanation. We'll hear back from Fatima if she has any, any follow-up questions, but that's great. Thank you. And we have and there, another question. Oh, go ahead. So I was just going to say there's a second part to the question about um, disadvantage, um, interventions being beneficial for people with disadvantage. So all of the studies that we included in the review, and that was one of our inclusion criteria, was that they had to have some kind of identified um, disadvantage as specified by the primary study authors. So. We didn't impose on the, on the studies themselves what we considered to be disadvantaged. The primary study authors had to make a case for why they felt um, the population that they were uh, dealing with, that they, they had some type of disadvantage. I don't know if that clarifies that part of the question or not. Oh, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Uh, we have another question from Daniel who's asking, Given the low health research literacy level among communities of color and vulnerable populations, do you have data on approaches to increase knowledge and skills of communities for community-engaged research? And what about specific training of researchers? That's actually a really good question. And uh, one of our colleagues, um, her name is Janet Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S. She received, and, and her colleagues, uh, received funding from the NIHR through the same um, program that we did at the same time. So it was commissioned concurrently, specifically looking at health literacy. Um, so although I don't feel the best person place to, to respond to that myself, um, Janet Harris has published a report on this. Yep. And she is at Sheffield? University Sheffield, Sheffield. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, so I really encourage you to look at that that work. It was uh, it was landmark. Yeah, yeah, it's a really nice piece of work. So if you Google Janet Harris Sheffield Health Literacy, you'll, she yeah. has a whole program of work, but she's done a, a systematic review similar to to ours, but specifically on health literacy. That's great. Thank you very much. We'll see if we can uh, maybe get that link posted during our session. Very helpful. Uh, so, and next we have a, a question from Michelle who's asking, if you found any literature regarding the effectiveness of child engagement strategies? Interesting. Um, we, when we were extracting information from the studies, we extracted information about the engagees, so they're the members of the community that were engaged to design or deliver the intervention. And we also extracted information about the participants in the HIP, so those that were receiving the intervention. Now, we had quite a number of studies were targeted at, um, or, or their population of interest were children, um, so they were the participants in the intervention. But I don't think we actually picked up any studies in which 
children were the engagees, so the people that were engaged to design and deliver the intervention. Um, that might require, I mean, we didn't exclude studies on that basis, we just didn't find any. That might require some targeted searching to specifically pick up uh, interventions where children were engaged. Am I, Ginny might be able to refresh my memory if I've missed I don't, no, I don't think so. Oh, actually, I just remembered the um, sexual health ones. There were some of the interventions in the sexual health topic. They had school students do um, PR, oh, yeah, 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 peer yeah. sexual health um, mediation and yeah, things like that. Yeah. yeah. So I, to be honest, I, I can't remember the specifics of the intervention, but that was one area where there were children involved in delivering the intervention. Um, yeah, sexual health, definitely. So if you're interested in that, that might be an area to look into the sexual health in schools, in school settings. Mm. That's great, thank you very much. And maybe we'll see more of that research coming out um, in the future as well. And so we have maybe time for one more question. Um, if that's okay with you, Allison and, and Ginny, we have quite a few questions from participants, which is great. So maybe we can get some of them to email those to you so we're not going too much over time. Um, but we do have one more question from Hamilton Public Health, who's asking if you encountered the term targeted universalism in your work, and how would that term fit with your findings about universal versus targeted approaches? Hello, Hamilton Public Health. That's my old stomping grounds. <laughs> nice to see you tuned in from there. <laughs> right. Great. Targeted, targeted universalism. We're just trying to think back. We we encountered a lot of many different terms, but I'm targeted universalism isn't one that's jumping straight to mind. That sounds like that sounds like something that I was reading um, that Michael Marmot's group talked about. Um, gaps and gradients. Yeah, yeah, when you're sort of you're talking about you know targeting an intervention to an entire population, but you're hoping to shift the health status. Well, you're hoping to shift the health status of everybody in that group. You're you're hoping to make particular gains amongst um, groups that are at disadvantage. So they they would be expected to make greater gains uh, in relation to the whole population. Um, but I, I don't know if that answers the question or not, but that's, uh, that's certainly a phrase I have seen. It's not something we analyze in, in the review. Um, so if, if there were, I, I don't remember coming across studies that were, would fit under that definition as, as Ginny just described it. Mm. Um, it was very much an either or universal or targeted, but it's possibly the case that you could Ah, uh, they're proportionate universalism. Yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah. the term I've come across yeah. more. Yeah, I don't know if they're synonyms. Well, there was very few instances where they did measure it in both ways. You know, to, 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 we were hoping we might be able to say something more about gaps and gradients analyses, yeah. but, but they they just weren't there. If you're interested in the health inequalities side of things, the the Marmot review is is very useful to read um, because there's a lot of discussion about gaps and gradients and, and proportionate universalism and um, debate about what's an appropriate approach. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting area. Yeah, unfortunately our review doesn't really talk to, couldn't talk to that because we didn't pick up on it in the literature. That's great. Thanks very much, and we're happy to see that you caught that extra that extra comment as well. So we're just starting to go over time, and we have about three questions left. So Ginny and Allison, would you prefer those questions to be emailed to you after the presentation? Or if you have some time, we're happy to read out those questions to you now as well. Uh, we can keep going for as long as there's not like a thousand more. If there are for sure, we have about uh, three more. So uh, one okay. more question from Kathy, who's asking if you can comment on the alignment of your theories of change with IAP2 spectrum. <laughs> well, the short answer is no, because I don't know what those are. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Maybe we can have uh, uh, Kathy connect with you on on that spectrum. Sure, yeah. Sure. That would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
And then just one more from Anna, who's asking if you can discuss your findings, a fit for purpose in light of uh, universal proportionalism. So kind of bringing back to that same question as well again. So what we found is that, um, so we covered a whole range of different interventions as you might be picking up from quite personalized ones like the, the breastfeeding support through to ones that were um, quite on a much broader scale. So for example, there were some interventions where um, uh, in a particular community, parents were concerned about the lack of immunization in their community. And so the parents in that area actually initiated their own public health um, intervention to encourage other parents to get their kids immunized. So trying to, to break down some of the, the myths around childhood immunization, basically, but coming from the parents. Now, the, the range of, of different ways of engaging the community we saw, like they're two examples of opposite ends of the spectrum, but th there was pretty much anything in between. And we think different um, approaches are going to make sense for different health problems. So having a peer counseling situation for childhood immunis immunization doesn't make sense. Whereas having a, a parent, um, promotion activity where they go out and encourage and break down the myths of, of um, childhood immunization makes much more sense. Um, it, it, it basically, you need to adapt the approach to the particular health problem and what, the, what, the, what makes sense for that situation, I guess. Yeah, and I think some of that goes back to the conceptual framework when you're thinking about the needs. Um, it's who's identifying that there's a health need to start with, you know, is it sort of a uh, government uh, body who's saying, you know, there, this is a real issue and we need to do something about it? Or is it, you know, as in the case that Allison provided, where parents are saying, actually, this is a problem because, you know, our kids are getting ill because other kids aren't immunized. Um, so that, that sort of thinking through the issues around why you might want to undertake a community engagement strategy um, and for what purpose. Is, is important and it's, it's worth taking into consideration before you even get something up and running. That's really great and really uh, important notes that you've made there. Uh, thanks for that response. And we just have one last question from uh, Marcia who's asking, uh, maybe if you can provide one or two overall suggestions that you would have for additional research in this area based on your findings from the review? Um, so we made a few recommendations in the report itself, um, picking out which ones. To, so there's practice implications of research, but in terms of research, one of the things that we noticed was that not all of the studies um, measured a range of different outcomes. And we saw different benefits of different interventions on different outcomes. So if you only measure one or two outcomes, so if you only focus on health uh, consequences like diagnosis or mortality, for example, you might miss some of those step changes in health behaviors or self-efficacy and things like that. So. One recommendation it would be to, if you're doing primary research in this area, you're doing evaluations, is to try and measure a broader range of outcomes, um, to pick up on a range of different benefits. And in particular, we thought there was a bit of a deficit around measuring benefits for the people that were engaged in the intervention. Um, there's some qualitative literature and, and theorizing around the notion of um, if you get people engaged and empower them, they then, beyond the intervention that they're involved in, they become kind of health ambassadors and they improve their own health, but also those around them going forward above and beyond what they did in the intervention. So it's about um, it upskilling and creating a whole new dynamic self-evolving community of people that care about improving health. Um, and some of the interventions that we saw, they, they continue on once the funding for the intervention finishes. The, the members of the com community were so excited or 
pleased with the intervention that they found and ways skilled. to and skilled, yeah, that they found ways to keep it going beyond the intervention. The measuring outcomes for the engaged people is another thing, and linked to my very last point about the time frame. So that there were benefits in some of these interventions that we got anecdotally and through the process evaluation that um, some of the interventions kept going beyond the, the, the intervention at lifespan itself, its natural lifespan, they kept it going. So there's a, a bit of a need for measuring longer term outcomes to see, you know, do, these, do the benefits that we see immediately after the, interven the intervention finishes, do they keep rolling on um, in the future? And, have, have we really instigated lifelong behaviour change or is it just a bit of a halo effect, you know, with the euphoria effect that's sometimes called, mm. that you've had fun in the intervention but once it all goes away, <laughs> yeah. are, are you, have you really fundamentally changed people's behaviours? So yeah. they're all around measurement of outcomes, I guess, in terms of my research recommendations. So there, there are others, but... We can't give them all away. You have to read the report now. <laughs> this is the taster, the teaser. That's really great, Allison. We appreciate that, especially from a, a research and a practice standpoint. Those are interesting, and we'll be sure to check out uh, the rest of the recommendations that you have in the report uh, as well. So we'll leave it there for, for today, and thank you so much for taking the time to respond to all those questions. We had so much um, participant engagement and user interest in this review and this webinar in particular. So we're very, very excited and pleased to have you present. Uh, for those who are still with us in the session, please note that a copy of the presentation will be made available on Health Evidence and we'll provide the links uh, to those resources in the chat section. So I'll leave it to you, Allison and Ginny, if you have any uh, just final small words for our audience before we close for the day. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time today to have a listen and for your excellent questions. It was really nice for us, I think, to uh, sit and think about community engagement again. It's one of our, our favorite topics. Yeah. <laughs> so, so thank you for we the love this review. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was hard, but it was good fun. Absolutely. So, yeah. Very appreciated. Yeah, we thank you, Health Health Evidence, for uh, for organising this. As I said, this is, we like opportunities to be able to communicate the findings um, on a bit more manageable scale because uh, we want this to be useful for people. And it breaks our heart a little bit that people might be turned off by the 548-page report. So uh, please <laughs> bear with us and and do ask questions if you if you have. Um, you, there's more specific information you'd like. We're happy to hear from people. Yeah. For sure. That's really great. And again, like I said, a very comprehensive and extensive review. We definitely appreciate all of the work that goes into that. Um, yeah, that cannot be overlooked. So that's really great. Thank you very much for presenting with us today and all of those who have uh, stayed throughout the session and asked great questions. With that, we close off our session today. So thank you, everyone, for joining us, and have a great afternoon.